be getting a copy of it. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for Hubbard Hall's first ever self-hosted webinar. This is a big deal for us. We've um, always been co-hosts with other, uh, other marketing efforts. So this time it's us on our own. So if we mess up a little bit or we stumble a little bit, um, bear with us as we work through it. I am Robin Deal. I am the product leader for Aquapure for Hubbard Hall. Aquapure is our wastewater treatment chemistry line. And we are pleased to bring you this webinar titled Five Ways to Future Proof Your Wastewater System. Today, I will be co hosting with Tim Pennington, editor in chief of finishingencoding.com. Tim, if you would like to introduce yourself. Certainly. Thanks for having me, Robin. This is a, a topic near and dear to my heart. I hope you believe that. And it certainly is because I think uh, it's something that every finishing and coding shop has their thumb on and they're trying to get better at it. So hopefully after today, they will have uh, five of their questions answered. So Tim, how we come about this webinar was you and I were talking about um, topics that we get asked a lot and things that get kicked around a lot um, behind the scenes at metal finishing shops that concern wastewater. So you suggested that we do five ways to future-proof your wastewater system. And we said, hey, that's a fantastic idea. So yeah, because I, I, yeah, I think that a lot of shops are always looking down the future as if their processes change or if their size changed or if they add more tanks, how will they know uh, that they've got enough capacity in their wastewater treatment system? So it's always, I think it's always a very timely topic, especially with a lot of operations want to uh, have some sort of expansion. If they can get enough people to work there, they would expand. So it's, it's always a good idea to make sure that um, whatever you do to your system can handle not only now, but in the future. So that does lead us to our first first tab for what can you do to future-proof your wastewater system. Um, what do you do when your production increases or you want to add a different production line? Um, maybe you historically are a phosphator and now you want to add a plating line. How do you ensure that your wastewater system is up to date and able to handle that. So one of the first things that you should do is look at your current wastewater system. Um, look at its hydraulic loading, what it can handle, what it's capable of doing, and ensure that it is capable of handling additional wastewater. So most systems are designed to go um, twice as much as you flow. So if you generally flow 30 gallons a minute, you design a system for 60 gallons a minute. A uh, lot of metal finishers, however, have found that 20 years ago, they installed a wastewater system and it was designed to handle a flow of 30 gallons a minute when they were smaller shops and they were running 15. But now they're in a position where they're running 90 gallons a minute and their wastewater system just is not adequate enough anymore. So over the years, they've added tanks, they've added pumps, they've kind of cobbled together a system and maybe it's not working so much for them anymore. So when that happens, what we have to look at is where is all of your wastewater coming from? What does it all look like? Where are your limits for what you can discharge? And how do we get there? <laughs> yeah, Rob, if I could ask a quick question. I know that um, we talked about expanding production uh, in a facility and you mentioned a lot of things that they should be considered, but what would you say would be uh, the first thing that they should look at uh, if, they're, if they're going to expand and making sure that their wastewater system is going to be uh, compatible with their expansion process? So what we call hydraulic loading rate for a wastewater system is how much water can a wastewater system flow and treat successfully. So you want to look at how many tanks you have, what the tank volume is, 
and how much water you run currently and how much water you wanna add. So if you know that you're gonna be adding a nickel plating line with three counterflow rinses and each rinse is gonna be adding two gallons per minute to your wastewater system, that's 120 gallons per hour additional per rinse, so times three is 360 gallons per hour that you will be putting in your wastewater system. And maybe your, your tanks and your pumps just aren't equipped to handle that. So that's the, the, the first place you need to start is can your wastewater system handle the flow that you wanna increase with additional production or additional um, new processes. So, so are there steps uh, that you would recommend? I mean, what are the, what's a, you know, the first thing, the second thing, the third thing that they would have to do to make sure uh, with that increase in water flow that they're gonna be able to handle that? So the, the first thing is um, be aware of how much water your system can flow and how much you're gonna increase to. The second is to check your chemistry to make sure that your wastewater treatment chemistry is still going to be adequate for the process changes, for the changes that will be coming down the line through wastewater. And then the third thing is to make sure that you're permitted to discharge additional water. Um, that's the three key steps for production increases. Um, the fourth thing is if you're adding a new metal to your rinses, um, say you are adding a nickel plating line, you've never had nickel in your wastewater before, you want to notify the city if you're a, if you're a pre-treat permit holder, um, just to let them know that, that you will be adding that to their, to their wastewater. Gotcha. So is you know, a, a, an increased flow, is that going to in, increase chemistry costs too? Is that going to, are they going to be spending more on that? Yes. So typically you have a cost to treat per gallon. Um, depending on what your processes are, it could be as low as two cents or as high as 11, 12 cents to treat per gallon. That doesn't change. But if you go from flowing um, 50,000 gallons a day to 100,000 gallons a day, your overall cost will change. So it's always a good idea to recheck your chemistry to make sure that you're using the optimal chemistry for your needs and that you're dosing um, where you should be dosing at. You're not overdosing your chemistry. Gotcha. So uh, what, what if, a, and, and again, in, in the process of expanding uh, 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 or, you know, adding new processes and, and updating your wastewater system that a company wants to, a shop wants to reduce the amount of wastewater. What, uh, what, what can be done in that regard? So if we're looking at reducing wastewater by going from flowing rinses to stagnant rinses or decreasing the flow of your rents from maybe two gallons per minute to one gallon per minute, what's going to happen is your rinses are going to become more concentrated so you're going to have to have more chemistry to treat, to remove the contaminants. So it generally doesn't work out to be a cost savings from the wastewater standpoint. However, if you're looking at reducing wastewater by putting in um, water recycling units, that's a totally different ballpark. And those can be very beneficial. Um, it helps keep your quality of water up to a level that your reject rates from cleaning and plating are lowered. And it also helps reduce your water footprint. Gotcha. So, so how can a company, I, I guess, who's, if they're getting ready to reduce the uh, amount of wastewater, what can they do to prep their system for that? Would, uh, if they do see a decrease in the amount of wastewater that they're going to be utilizing? So in wastewater, a good rule of thumb is too much is just as bad as not enough. So if you're going to reduce your wastewater drastically, but you're still going to be treating some, 
you want to make sure your system isn't oversized anymore. Hmm. Um, oversized systems tend to cause more problems than the proper size system um, because water sits longer in the tanks. Um, as it sits there, its characteristics will change. And especially in things like clarifiers where the solids have already settled out, if you leave the solids settled out in a tank too long, they'll start releasing their metals and their con contaminants back into the water. Mm. So you might see an increase in your um, discharge numbers from doing that. So if you're going to go from a really large flow, like 100,000 gallons a day to maybe 10,000 gallons a day, and I have seen companies successfully do that, mm. you want to make sure that you decrease your wastewater size as well. Gotcha. Um, just quickly, are there, are there two or three or four uh, really tips that you can give companies about uh, how to be more cost effective uh, when they do expand their operation? What are, what are some tips that you would suggest that they do? Um, make sure that you're using the proper chemistry for what you need. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're not overdosing your chemistry. A lot of people think a little is a good thing is good. So a lot is better. better right. They'll turn up their chemistry, which in turn causes problems, especially if you're using metal precipitants such as DTC or sulfides, because how these, those products work is they, um, they're, they're actually chelators in their cells and they will pull metals away from things like citric acid or EDTA, which is how they break the chelation bond and allow the metals to precipitate out. But if you overdose them, they'll hang around in the wastewater holding on to their metals. And so you'll see a metal increase versus gotcha. a decrease. So that's the number one tip. Make sure you have the right chemistry for the job that you're doing. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're going to talk about metal remover now, aren't we? I know that's yes. something that, that sometimes I get a little confused on, but uh, go right ahead. What, what, what's your, your, your best thoughts on that? So metal removal can happen in a couple of ways. Physical chemical treatment, there's two ways to do it. Um, hydroxide precipitation and sulfide precipitation. They work the same way, but at different pHs and with different um, chemical additives. So hydroxide precipitation usually runs at a higher pH and you use a hydroxide such as sodium hydroxide or calcium hydroxide to introduce those hydroxides into the water that will then bond with your metals and fall out. Um, hence why it's called hydroxide precipitation. And then sulfide precipitation tends to happen at a much lower pH. And you usually use sodium sulfides to do this with. Um, and again, the sulfides that are introduced to the water form the bonds with the metals and that will help them fall out at the proper pHs. Gotcha. Uh, and I, I get confused sometimes with the, you know, a, a coagulant, a flocculant, and a metal precipitate. So what are all those words? How would you define those? So we know the difference. So a lot of people um, interchange the words. A coagulant is the first step of wastewater treatment. If you have zero chelators present and you're able to just add sodium hydroxide to get your pH to the desired point, that's your coagulant. Because at the right point, you'll start seeing this little flex appear in your wastewater. But in metal finishing, most people have some form of chelator that requires help to, to precipitate out the metals. So coagulants are that first chemistry that's added at the starting pH of the wastewater. They can be iron, calcium, aluminum, or rare earth based. That's the four most common forms. Then when you adjust your pH up and you see that pin flock form, that first step of coagulation, the flocculant is that slimy stuff that you add. Mm -hmm. And it can be anionic, non-ionic, or cationic. It can come in powdered form, emulsion form, or ready to use form. 
and it carries different charges and different um, strand lengths. So one may work really well where another one won't. In most metal removal cases, we want to use anionic polymers or flocculants. Then a metal precipitant is what you need when you have a heavy chelation and proper pH adjustment, proper coagulation, and proper flocculation doesn't see you getting your metals to the limits that you need for discharge. Um, metal precipitants can be sulfides. They can be DTCs um, or carbamates. They can be carbonates and they can be blends. So there's a lot of variety in those products. And it's easy to understand why some people mix the words up and get confused as to which is which. Well, then that follows up with which, which type would you want for your system? And, uh, which type of coagulant or flock? It sounds like there's several different types. So which, which would be the ones that would be best for your system? How do you determine that? Then? So with metal removal, there's a thing called um, metal affinity. So on our periodic table, as we read left to right and bottom to top, the closer the metals are on the metal affin on the periodic table, the higher their affinity is. So coagulants have of the iron, calcium, aluminum, or rare earth base have affinities for almost all metals, but some have a higher affinity for a particular metal than others. So if you're mainly trying to remove, say, nickel, you would want to use an aluminum based coagulant because it has a higher affinity for nickel. Um, where if you're wanting to remove chrome, you'd want to use an iron based because it has a higher affinity. So your wastewater um, chemical rep tech person should know which coagulant works best for what you need. And then they should be able to dial in based off of that. Then for your flocculants, if you're mainly using, if you're mainly removing metals, you wanna use an anionic flocculant. But say you have some organics from your cleaners present, you may find that you want a cationic low charge flocculant that will help capture the metals as well as those organics. And again, your, your um, wastewater rep should be able to help you dial that in to where you're getting good, clear effluent with low metals every time. So is there a, a equipment that uh, is out there to help um, a, a coating operation, you know, test, test their water in-house to tell them how they're doing? Is that, is that equipment available for that? Or? Yes. So a lot of um, metal finishing shops already have in their lab um, an AA, an atomic absorption, or some form of uh, metal testing, those, those work for just in-house purposes. Hawk makes excellent test kits for wastewater um, that are super easy to use and really user-friendly. So those two are probably the most common that I've seen in our industry being used. Um, Hawk has a, what they call a DR900, which will test for about anything you need to test for. In wastewater, you just have to buy it and the test kits, where an AA will test for any metal that you may have present. Hmm. Gotcha. So if you know if a if a if a processor, if they if they add a process of a new metal, how how can they tell if they're actually being able to then remove that metal from their wastewater? Is there uh, you know, if they're doing hex chrome or something and they want to remove it, how, how can they tell if they're actually removing it uh, the way they should be? So bench testing is our, is the industry standard for ensuring what you do in your wastewater system works. And bench testing is where you take a smaller sample of your water, say a thousand milliliters, and you do everything to that sample that you are doing in your larger wastewater system you introduce your, your coagulant, you do your pH adjustment, you introduce your flocculant, you settle it out, and then you test. It's much easier to test on a smaller scale on a snapshot than it is to test on a system that's flowing 100 gallons a minute. 
So bench test, bench test, bench test. If you're introducing a new metal and you're unsure of how to treat it, reach out to your chemical rep and say, hey, I need some help. They should be willing to come in and bench test with you and educate you on how to successfully remove any new contaminants that are present. And that's not just metal, that's any new contaminants. Say you're changing a cleaner and you wanna know how that's gonna impact your wastewater, test it in benches before you actually introduce it to your wastewater system. Gotcha. Okay, so we've talked about uh, planning if you're going to expand, how to plan. Uh, and then we've talked about uh, uh, removing metal, and phosphorus. That's what gets me next. Okay, phosphorus. What, what should people know about phosphorus? So I think at, at this stage in the game, most people understand what, that phosphorus is bad for the environment. Maybe they don't understand why it's bad. So phosphorus is classified as a nutrient along with nitrogen. When they're in the environment in excess, they call, cause a problem called eutrophication, which is where um, algae blooms take over and they mm -hmm. uptake all, the algae uptakes all the oxygen in the water. And so therefore nothing else can live. So everything dies in the water but the algae and then eventually it dies and it produces foul odors. Um, it makes it where you can't use the water for a drinking water source or for recreation. So that's why we want to remove phosphorus from our wastewater. Right. Um, and so how do you do it? What, what processes are, are, are there in the metal finishing industry to, to remove it? And I'm sure a lot of the local uh, regulatory agencies are probably cracking down on that more than ever. But uh, what processes do uh, can shops use to remove that? Or how do they remove it? So depending on the shop um, and what form of phosphorus they have, it might be a phosphate coating, it might be a cleaner that they have to use, or it might be um, a phosphoric acid that they're using. You can do it a couple of ways. You can do it with physical chemical treatment, which is a coagulation, pH adjustment, and flocculation. You can pre-treat mm -hmm. and doing that and then introduce the water to your main wastewater system. Um, you can also use bacteria. So bacteria is becoming more and more popular as a polishing process for our, our industry. So after you treat everything and, and remove all of the contaminants and all the metals, maybe you still have phosphorus and high BOD, COD loading, you can run your wastewater through a biological process where bacteria will consume the phosphorus and the BOD, COD, as a food source and convert it to um, nitrogen, basically, which is then gassed off in the process. Right, right. What, which, uh, did if I mention, what, what processes, I, I really hear a lot about high phosphorus, low phosphorus, what processes generate a lot of phosphor, phosphorus in the metal finishing uh, facilities? Electrolysis nickel is one that okay. is very highly laden um, and that has a low, a mid, and a high FOSS type mm -hmm. uh, levels. Uh, accelerated mass finishing that uses phosphoric acid can produce a lot of phosphorus in wastewater. Any type of phosphated coating such as zinc, manganese, or iron. And then there's cleaners. So I think a lot of us have moved away from phosph phosphated cleaners, but there are, are still some that are very niche market and work extremely well and are specced into certain cleaning processes and applications. So those are the four general areas. Um, anodizers that use bright dips that are phosphoric acid based also can see a high phosphate loading. Gotcha, okay. Uh, talk about recovery. I mean, there are options to recover phosphorus uh, yep. before sitting out wastewater. Yes, um, there's a lot out there. Metal finishing, there's equipment you can buy that can help you recover and reuse the chemistry, such as um, membrane systems that will mm. clean the cleaner type systems. Um, there's also 
evaporation recovery systems. So there are options out there. You just have to research out which one is best for your company and is it a cost-effective process for you. Um, in some cases, it's better just to, to treat, to remove the phosphorus and let the water go out, go out the door. Gotcha. Okay. All right, let's move. No, what next tip do we have? Do water, do water, do water. Dewater. So a lot of people go, what is dewatering and why is it important? So when you have a physical chemical wastewater treatment system or a biological treatment system, however you treat your wastewater, you generate solids. When you generate solids, they are kind of like a, just kind of hanging out in your water. And they are, hold a lot of water. So when you take your solids, you pay to ship your solids off site, whether it's F006 or uh, delisted, you pay per pound. So you wanna get them as dry as you can before shipping off site. So you reduce your, your uh, disposal costs. Right. So this picture is how a plate and frame filter press works. Um, most wastewater systems that are flow through have what's called a sludge thickener tank. And that's where the solids are drawn off the bottom of whatever clarifier they're used, you're using and held into one tank and allowed to settle even further. And then the sludge at the bottom, which is like a runny mud, is pumped through the filter press. And once the insides, as you can see, where it's clear and then it turns orange, the orange represents where the solids are trapped in between these plates. Once that's, they're full and there's no more room, you turn on an air blowdown system, which pushes air through the, the mud that's trapped between the plates and dries it even further so that now you have um, about a 75 to 85% weight reduction because you've removed that much water from your sludge. Got it. And that's less that you're hauling away. That's less, and, less weight that you're hauling away. Right. And then you can ad additionally go from that to what's called a sludge dryer unit, which takes the cake from this filter press and pow dries it to the point where it's powdered. Hmm. So now you're basically sending out powder. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So besides from the, the plate and frame presses, uh, uh, filter presses, are there other ways to, to get to deal water or is that uh, the solids or is that? So there's a couple other ways. Um, another common way is called an indexing filter. They don't, it doesn't get the sludge as dry as a plate and frame press, but basically it's a roll of filter cloth that unroll, unravels across a tank, you know, unrolls across the tank and your, your sludge is put on top of the filter cloth and then the water, um, your filtrate drains through the filter cloth into the tank underneath and it will index or move forward as a weight limit is reached and thus dispose of the solids by moving forward and dropping them into a hopper or a roll off or a disposal bag. Gotcha. Then uh, there's what's called a belt press, which is taking that indexing filter a step further. And instead of rolling off into a hopper, it goes through a series of rollers where it squeezes between two belts tighter and tighter and squeezes all the water out. There's also what's called a screw press, which is basically a big auger that will pull the sludge up and run it through a screw that gets tighter and tighter and thus gives you out um, dry sludge will fall out of the top of the screw. So those are a couple of other options that people can use. Um, there's also a rotary vacuum processes that work really well as well. Gotcha. So if they have a like a wet sloppy cake, that's obviously means they haven't taken all the water out, correct? Um, yes, but that also is indicative of maybe overdosing 
a mm. chemical in the treatment process. Right. So your cake should always be pretty solid and of a modeling clay consistency where you can kind of crumble it and smash it a little bit, but it should be solid and dry. Mm. Um, okay. Where if it's not, if it's slimy, if it's wet, you've at some point most likely overdosed your flocculant and coated your, um, your plates, the filter cloth on the plates to the point where water can't get through. So you probably need to do an acid wash on your filter press. Gotcha. So besides hauling these away, do these solids, can they be recycled or what is it that uh, else they can do just besides paying to have them take to the landfill then? So actually, yeah, a lot of companies that do like heavy copper, heavy nickel, if the, the concentration of the metal in your solids is 10% or higher, can that their solids can then be put into a recycle program where a company will take them at and give you a credit back. So maybe instead of paying $3,000 mm. um, for a 30 cubic foot roll off, you're only paying 1,500, they'll, they'll give you a credit back. And then they recover the metals out of your solids. Um, there's also companies that will take your solids and incorporate them into other products such as concrete. So there are a lot of ways to dispose of solids other than just yeah. landfilling or incineration. So is there a way to uh, make the, you know, the F006 uh, not non-hazardous before it goes away or? There is. Um, research is being done in using different types of activated carbon and introducing it into the sludge thickening process. And then the carbon will uh, absorb the metals themselves. And then it won't release the metals. So under T-clip testing, you can declassify that way. But again, it's, it's, it's a cost effective if you're only disposing of uh, maybe a one ton bag every month, it might not be worth it to introduce that carbon. So cost analysis is key to that. Right. You know, I, I, I did a story a couple, uh, maybe a month or so back, at aircraft actually on Los Angeles who did exactly what you're talking about. I remember uh, they said they went from like five to seven tons of F006 uh, every three months to basically sh they're shipping uh, a cubic yard every six months. So it's like a huge savings yes. uh, if they can get down with that. So that, that seems like a, a worthwhile, even if you're not expanding or uh, your, your wastewater system of taking a very hard look at that. So great. Good it, information. it certainly is. Um, and is, and any way you can reduce your solids is a good thing. So you mm -hmm. want to look at, are you using the right chemistry? Um, a lot of people will use, say, ferric chloride because it's cheap and readily available, or it used to be, but you wind up using so much more of it to achieve what a proprietary blended coagulant could do. Um, often we see a 20% sludge reduction just getting people off of ferric chloride. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we talked about increasing uh, your wastewater and the me uh, metal removal, the phosphorus, uh, then dewatering. Uh, what else? What other considerations? What other things that we, the people should be looking at uh, for their wastewater system? So I put this big red truck up because I we like that all truck, yeah. know, we hmm. all know transportation shortages are happening everywhere. Hmm. Um, transportation costs are going up. Chemical shortages are happening. So you need to be able to forecast how much chemistry you're going to use and how much footprint you have for storage for that chemical. That's, that's kind of a key component that many people overlook. A lot of people will forecast how much plating chemistry they need or cleaning chemistry they need on hand to run for six weeks. People should be looking at their wastewater in the same terms. Um, cost increases are rolling out almost daily in some cases and actual physical chemical shortages are just insane right now. Right, 
All right. What what uh, what chemicals are you seeing that are are coming up short? Um, anything with silicates in it. Um, for wastewater, that usually means defoamers. So silicone defoamers are starting to get scarce. If you use a defoamer, you might want to reach out to your rep, whoever supplies that for you, and just ask, hey, is there another option for defoaming for us? Is there something else we can do? Is there a different defoamer you off offer um, if you get short on that? Flocculants themselves are, um, we're on a 10-week lead time for orders for mm -hmm. flocculants. So you really need to make sure you have enough on hand to last the, at least that long and make sure you order ahead on flocculants. And believe it or not, ferric chloride is extremely hard to get right now. Um, we're not taking additional ferric chloride customers because we can't guarantee a supply for them. Um, right. It's it's become so bad for ferric for some of the wastewater and water chemicals that the EPA has put on their website a link to a page that will tell you um, different companies that can manufacture and supply the chemistries that you need in your area. Mm, interesting. If your normal supplier runs out, runs out. Uh, but are there, what options do people have then for, uh, are there other options for like, so the coagulants, the flocculants, the defomers, are there other ones? Yeah, definitely work with your chemical rep, your, your field service tech to see if you're on an iron based coagulant program right now to see if there's a way you can move to a calcium or an aluminum and, or even a rare earth, depending on what you're removing to see the same removal efficiencies. Getting off iron will only help you in the long run at this point. In six months, it may be totally different. We, the market may be flooded, but right now it's kind of hard to get. Um, right. Defoamers, if you're on a silicone-based defoamer, maybe look at a siloxin-based or maybe um, a mineral spirit-based defoamer or maybe looking at what is actually causing your foam and seeing if there's a way that you can mitigate foam formation in your wastewater system. And for flocculants, maybe look at switching to a powdered if you're on an emulsion. Um, they tend to last longer than the emulsions. An emulsion has a typical shelf life of six months where a powder, as long as you keep it dry and it takes up a lot less space, you can, um, bring those in maybe three bags, four bags, and take up the same space you would take up for a couple of pails of an emulsion and it would last significantly longer. Right, so, okay, so you're trying to make it stretch then. And I guess right. any other uh, any other suggestions on how they can make it stretch? That's, that would help uh, bench, that regard. bench testing to make sure that mm -hmm. you're, do you're not overdosing. I can't stress that right. enough. If you, if you not overdose, that's the optimal thing to do. Right. Okay. Well, that, that, like I said, maybe that's a big question: is how how often have people bench test to really find out uh, find out those numbers? So, okay, great. Uh, all right. Yes. The, the, the review the five takeaways. This is what you've covered. Go over those. So, step one: uh, five ways to future-proof your wastewater system. Make sure your wastewater system is sized properly for your flow. Whether you're increasing your flow or decreasing your flow, make sure your system can handle the hydraulic load you're sending it. Then you wanna make sure, you, number two, you, that you have the correct chemistry to remove the contaminants from your wastewater. Then number three, if you have phosphorus in your wastewater, make sure that you are aware of any incoming changes to your permit for discharge. We're seeing these happen weekly now. Companies are, in, uh, metal finishing companies are getting down to 10 or less PPM or milligrams per liter phosphorus in their effluent. A lot of cities are getting to where they have to be below one. So they're rolling that back to their industries. Then number four, make sure you are properly dewatering your solids for disposal. And if there's ways that you can help it by either sending it for recycling or changing it from a D-list to an, I mean, from an F006 to a D-list, that's something you should be looking at. 
And then make sure you have options if your wastewater chemistry is um, on a shortage list. Make sure you know where you can go to either get it or that you have backup plans for what to switch to. Gotcha. Well, that's five good takeaways right there. I think everybody should be doing that, whether you're expanding or not. I think you should be Absolutely. looking at looking at all those, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So then um, there's all these other things that people ask about. Hexavalent chrome reduction is pretty mm. standard. You want to use a reducing agent at a pH of two and a half with a positive 250 ORP. That's the pretty standard chrome reduction. Um, PFAS, PFAS is a hot topic right now. The EPA is working so hard to set up limits and regulate it. And uh, they've, this, they've added test methods to the standard methods for water and wastewater labs so that we can now test for some of it. Um, fat soles and grease is something that a lot of people are concerned about in their wastewater if they have lubes or hydraulic leaks, uh, permits are changing as cities are getting pushed back from the EPA to tighten their limits. They're right. pushing yeah. back to our industries to tighten their limits on metals and fat soles and grease and things like that. Yeah, a lot more to think about. Like I said, I, I've always thought it was one of the most uh, important part of the uh, probably you know, mis most misunderstood part of a, a you know, a, a coating and plating operation. So yeah, definitely. It's all right. I've Looks often like guys, heard, yeah. I was Go gonna ahead. say to him, I've often heard of it referred to as the black magic. And as long <laughs> as it's kind of over there in the corner and it's not causing the city to knock right. on the door. Leave it alone, right? Leave yeah. it alone. But what we're finding is that's no longer the case. You really have to pay attention to your wastewater systems. Um if you have a system that's 30, 40 years old, maybe look at upgrading it. A lot of people are going to um, a SCADA type system where they can remote monitor it and mm -hmm. they don't have to physically be at the wastewater system all the time anymore. That's, that's a way to future proof your system. If right. you don't have to have a body standing there watching your tanks and you can do everything from the plating line on your laptop hey let's do it that's uh, that's an even better thing to do right i see you've got a got a question here from someone uh um, okay. can you see that question i cannot so well, i'll read it to you that'll uh, work yeah well, i'm, I'm going to try <laughs> which metal should be in my coagulant to remove molly bedenum is that right Did so we right? yeah so we have found that molybdenum i and i have a hard time saying it too tim I just call it Molly for short. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have found that calcium tends to be the best at removing Molly from our testing standpoints. Mm -hmm. It's one of those tricky metals. Um, so bench test to make sure that you have the right products and start with the calcium based coagulant. Right. Right. Okay, next question we have here. Uh, we use a rotary drum vacuum filter and we attain a sludge that's almost bone dry. Uh, Which is really good. That's what those types of uh, systems are designed for. I'm assuming you're using something like a diatomaceous earth to coat that. And those systems are amazing. I love watching them run. Got gotcha. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I, I know, like I said, it, all, it always is a very good topic. I know whenever we post articles, it's some of the most read things ab about that, um, uh, you know, the wastewater system. And I think this has been very helpful. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, people have more questions. I'm sure they can ring you up or, or email you or contact you some way, shape or form. Yes. So watch your emails for a follow-up email from Hubbard Hall. It will have this recording with it and contact information to reach back to us with any questions you may think of later. I know a lot of times in webinars, uh, people are concentrating on everything that's being said and they're not really um, thinking about questions to ask, but maybe five minutes from now, once right. we log <laughs> off, you'll get a question will pop in your head. And you'll say, I really wish I had a thought to ask Robin how to remove 
zinc or if there's a way to remove nitrogen. So right. look for that follow-up email with the recording and don't be afraid to reach out to us. Right. I think we should do this again. Thanks for letting me be a part of this, Rob. Well, thank you, Tim. I always enjoy talking with you about wastewater. There you go. We got to talk about other stuff, but wastewater will, will be fine today. Okay. <laughs> All righty.